before I introduce the group, I would like to talk about a couple, uh, couple points to really discuss. You know, I always have a theme every year, and uh, these fine people to my left help uh, energize us through the discussion. So I'd like to show a brief 30-second video, and that will team it all over. Alcon and Allergan can't get along. There's a, there's a saying, they can't find the same chair. Sorry, Mike, really. Yeah. <laughs> hey, sorry, Mike, this is, this is consolidation at its best. Do you have a chair, Mike? Oh. Good, good, okay. So I'm going to show a brief little video real quick. Do you play video games? No. My kids do. There's this one game that my son Charlie, he loves to play. It's called Agario. I have to admit, I might have played it a couple of times myself. Start out as a little dot, and then you go around eating these other dots, and you get bigger. The bigger you get, you got to avoid getting eaten by the bigger players. Meanwhile, you're trying to eat the smaller players. Hmm. Sounds a little like running for president. So hopefully you've all seen, who's seen House of Cards? It's obviously, uh, I think we're playing it out in the real world today. Um, but for those who don't, if you don't know the game, um, it's a game of you try to get the big dots to, buy the, to grab and eat the little dots. And so when I was thinking about this discussion and thinking about our industry, uh, it really is when games somewhat become reality. So let me play a little history lesson with uh, many of you in this room. 20 years ago, this is kind of the space. You know, we had Nestle and an Allergan and Bosch and Lom, Johnson Johnson's Ice and fairly small companies around, and this is just 20 years ago. Then um, Ball and Pyatt didn't like me, and so we, we created uh, AMO. Uh, Nestle decided that uh, they'd get rid of uh, Alcon and let Alcon run on our own. Bosch and Lom hung it around. Johnson Johnson was there, and then came Zeiss playing a bigger and bigger role. That's 15 years ago. And then, of course, 10 years ago, Warburg Pincus and, and Bosch and Lohm. And then you saw some of the smaller companies coming on and being acquired. And then you look at the landscape today. Uh, so, and then not only the landscape of these bubbles changing, um, but if you look to my left, you've got some people coming back, like Mike. Uh, we lost him for a couple years, and Mike's come back. Nice to have you back, Michael. Uh, William here, joining us from a different industry. Um, it's funny, uh, Bill, sorry, Bill, but you're kind of the old man in the group there, but uh, don't worry about it, but the stalwart, maybe that's a better word, stalwart of it. But the other point about the, the, the leadership that's changed is also one of the topics that I want to get to is we've seen where it was pharma and device and then device and pharma, pharma and device, and now device and pharma. So there's a lot been going on in the industry, and these people to my left are, are leading it. So. Uh, I'm going to tee up some questions, and then, as you know, I kind of do a group questions from that standpoint. And if you don't know them, here they are. I think uh, we all know them, and I do appreciate it. They put a lot of time, and uh, some of them just flew in just for this, so I do want to thank, thank all of you on behalf. So I'm going to start off with you, Ashley. Um, you know, you've had, J&J's had a long track record, very good stability, and and dividend growth, but recently the business has appears to shift it towards a pharma-led model, leaving that consumer health care and medical device behind. So given the uncertainties of the pharmaceutical market, uh, what should we expect from J&J &J in terms of devices? So uh, good afternoon, Jim. It's good to be back to OIS. Uh, I could say a couple things. J&J, &J, we believe in diversification. So we really have four groups. We've got the medical device group, the pharmaceutical group, the consumer group, and I actually represent our fourth group, which I like to say is right in the center, and that's consumer med tech. And that's really the intersection of doctors with consumer-driven goods. So I represent diabetes as well as eye health. So our chairman just recently, Alex Gorski, really declared in quarter one, one of the emerging areas of focus for Johnson & Johnson will be lung cancer, metabolics, diabetes, and eye health. And so we're quite bullish on eye health. Um, you know us as a contact lens company. Some of us worked for IO Labs many years ago. Uh, we have a very active cell therapy program for the back of the eye geographic atrophy. 
And I guess what I would share with our audience here is we think at J&J, &J, the best value to create value for patients and solve problems is to take advantage of, I'll call as an example, our biologics expertise. So we have a folks in our cell therapy team who know biologics inside and out, yet they don't know how to go to create a device, let alone the persnickety tiny area of the anatomy of where that device needs to go into the back of the eye. So we tapped into our Ethicon endo surgery uh, process engineers to create a unique device. We also tapped into our vision care folks who understand optical sciences and eye physiology and really through that unique enterprise-wide collaboration enabled us to solve problems, get the right prototype, and we're in phase 2B right now with Dr. Alan Ho. We just had our second patient in last week in Will's Eye, so stay tuned. Ludwin, Carl Zeiss controls 65% of the shares of Carl Zeiss Meditech. So how does that influence your ability to grow Zeiss? Yeah, first of all, I should say Zeiss is not a pharmaceutical company, right? You're drug-free. Uh, Zeiss is a very um, a traditional technology company, um, and that actually is very important to understand what their interests in, um, in the medical business are. So that um, um, size is a group of companies. They have um, uh, six business groups uh, which are dedicated to um, um, special individual markets. So the largest business of that um, group of companies is the um, medical business, um, which is in a separate legal entity called Size Meditech. Now that group of company has, uh, companies um, has a lot of technologies which are available to all of the, the businesses, which is an advantage when it comes to uh, growth. The um, medical business makes up 25% of, um, of size. Um, so you can think of it as a core um, portfolio element and the interest of the size group is to really um, grow this long term. So they have a long term interest. Now, that's the, um, the um, size ownership. And then um, 14 years ago, we decided um, actually to go public with the medical business. Um, and that gives us um, a lot of financial flexibility on the other hand. So you could think of um, uh, Carl Zeiss Meditech enjoying the best of two worlds. The one is the stability and the long-term orientation of a, a private owner. And on the other hand, the financial flexibility of the public market. Welcome back, Michael. Nice to have you back in Thank our industry. Uh, Mike and I have not known each other for a long time. So Mike, you've come back now, and uh, while you were gone, uh, Alcon kind of did something differently. So you now have the medical device business. So now, as Novartis looks at you from medical device and pharma, how does that influence the decision making for you as you fight for resources within Novartis? Well, I think it's like uh, any company, right? You're always deciding where to put your investments, and it really comes down to having a good game plan and uh, the importance of Alcon to Novartis. Now, Novartis, a few years ago, paid over $50 billion for Alcon, and if you look at the market cap of Novartis, that's about 30%, and if you listen to last quarter's earning call, about 30% of the questions were on Alcon. So, you know, Alcon is very important to Novartis. So, from a resource standpoint, I think it really comes down to how good of a game plan do you have? Right now, we are a medical device company, which has really allowed us to do a couple of things. One is really focus on medical device innovation, which I think is very different than pharma innovation, and also to be far more customer-centric. And so I do like the support we're getting for, from Novartis. Uh, you might have seen in the last 60 days, we did three business development deals. Uh, very excited about all of them. And so as I look down the road and I look at this industry, ophthalmology is a tremendous field. And I think as it comes to, quote unquote, battling for resources, when you look at the opportunities ahead of us here, I feel very, very good about where we are. Tom, you, when you talk to Miles, can you just tell him he got AMO for a steal based on what Mike just said, Novartis paid for Alcon. Uh, so Tommy, three acquisitions. Mike's been busy, he just got there. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of the last acquisition AMO made. So tell me what's going on there and how you plan in your time. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. 
Very fair. And th and this is very funny. fair. Well, uh, the last acquisition uh, um, Abbott made was just uh, about a week ago in the cardiovascular business. So we've certainly proved that we're not afraid to pull the trigger. Uh, but in ophthalmology, uh, I guess Optometica in 2013 when we jumped into the femto business on the cataract side, and that uh, acquisition is certainly meeting our expectations. But I think from um, an overall perspective, uh, where we work our capital, where we invest our capital, it's all about, to me, new technologies that uh, offer a compelling market opportunity and a strategic fit. Two, does the technology work? And three, can the doctor make money? Uh, and if the doc, if the surgeon economics are there, and some might argue that's the first criteria to, to check off, but I think if you have a compelling market, technology that works, and favorable surgeon economics, we're going to be interested. Thanks, Tom. I'm sure I'm going to pay for that question a little later. <laughs> you uh, already Bill, have. Yeah, yeah. Bill Murray, when you were going to be part of Pfizer, uh, the ophthalmology business would have been 5% of revenue. Uh, so n you would have been really fighting an uphill battle for resources, and I remember your talk at ACOS about talking to that. Now that Pfizer deal has dissolved, you're the number two franchise in the overall Allergan. So how, again, similar thought, even though you're not um, number one, you still are start fighting for resources within the large Allergan. How do you handle that? Well, yeah, as a practical matter, uh, eye care and Allergan is essentially tied for number one and probably the fastest growing product line. And we view uh, Allergan as a, an eye care company. Uh, and although hypothetically, if we had completed the merger with Pfizer, it would have been the fastest growing business in the fastest growing division at, at Pfizer. Um, it comes down to, Mike mentioned it earlier, uh, a really good game plan about solving for the number one problem everyone has to solve for, which is innovation and, and product flow and understanding uh, customers. Uh, we operate in three areas right now, uh, dry eye or ocular surface disease, uh, glaucoma and, and retina. Uh, we have a very, very aggressive and fast moving business development uh, group. Uh, we probably examine, evaluate, and talk to more companies than maybe most companies in, in the industry. We don't have a this isn't invented here mentality, and we don't have a monopoly on all the good ideas. And we need small companies around the world, inside and outside the United States, to build our product line. And so eye care is essentially number one at, at Allergan. It'll be that way for a long time because it's a great market to be in. Whether you look at the innovation that's being done, pricing dynamics, um, the expertise that we have in both regulatory and development on both the pharma, the implant or device, and the procedure side. We're more developed in pharmaceuticals, uh, but we're advancing into those other areas as we speak. Okay, thanks. Dr. Link, so now you got new players, some other players, the whole strategic landscape, if you take my bubble since the years you've been there, how does that change your outlook from a venture standpoint? Well, I think it's, um if you look at the market first and say, is it a big market? Is it growing? Or is there plenty of unmet need? It's an amazing market. So we better pay attention to it. And um, so stability of leadership has an impact. It does. It, it does. But guess what? Uh, leadership settles and, and gets on its feet. And then we regain traction. And, <clears throat> and I would just use the dynamic example of Pfizer being so attracted you know, uh, into this area, didn't quite happen, so to speak. Did that destabilize uh, the new Allergan? Yeah, for a moment, but lands on its feet, gets refocused and going. So, you, so you know, when I'm uh, when I'm looking at um, at an industry, I, may, I mainly first start with the market. No kidding, and if it's strong and um, and resilient, then the industry figures it out and sorts it out. And you know, the, the, what's so real about eye care vision is it's multiple markets. There's vision related that's not disease related. Mm -hmm. There's disease related that's not age related. And there's age related to diseases. And so we just have this beautiful challenging complex overlap of multiple 
markets all in one area <coughs> that we refer to as eye care or, or uh, eye health or vision. And, to, and so it, it's, it's common sense then that a single corporate profile and skill set isn't going to be able to address each and every one of those segments, even though the segments overlap a bit. And Cal, so obviously Valiant's gone through some interesting changes over the last couple months. So how, and Andy did a really nice job today kind of explaining b &L. Love to hear your perspective as you fight for resources now because you have a very diverse model at Valiant. Yeah, so the, the Valiant model is a decentralized model. So where each company runs as a separate entity. And so we have to decide how we want to use our own resources for our own capital expenditure. So two examples. Uh, at the end of last year, we acquired Synergetics, which we thought was a really great fit as part of our aspiration to be the number one company when it comes to vitreoretinal retinal surgery. And so we're, we're making that acquisition really work for us and, and grow that business. At the same time, we're spending a half a billion dollars in order to upgrade our facilities in order to make really next generation contact lenses. And so that's another capital expenditure that we're making. It's really interesting that you hear so much about Valiant, and then, but you also hear that Bausch & Lam is the prize jewel. And so uh, we always take advantage of that. So if anybody ever says anything, oh, by the way, we are the prize jewel. <laughs> so now I'm gonna open it up. I'm gonna say Mike, Ashley, and Tom has, and I'll go in that order, has consolidation moved us away from developing a category? I remember Mike at ACOSH, you said when you came back that you were surprised to see what happened to the category while you were gone. So has consolidation impacted innovation? I, I don't think that consolidation is responsible for impacting the innovation either in the marketplace or with products. You know, what we talked about at ACOS was about all the opportunity I saw having been out the market for maybe a decade, at least from a surgical standpoint, and come in and see all the opportunities in the market, much like Bill said. I mean, I look out there, I see all those glasses out there and reading glasses. My God, there's a couple of million bucks right in this room here if you come over and see me after this talk. But the, the thing is, if you look at things like refractive surgery, it was at 1.6 million procedures a year in the U.S. It's down to 600,000. If you look at advanced technology IOLs, it's only penetrated the market some 10, 12 percent. That should be up in the 20, 30 percent marker. Presbyopia, there's really not a lot been happening in terms of actual real live outcomes. There's stuff in the pipeline. So I think the market is huge. I think what you have to do if you're in a big company or even with investors is come with a good game plan. You show them potential and growth, they'll go for it. Ashley? No, I mean, I guess I'd offer two thoughts. One is around activating the consumer, activating the patient in this, in this chronic disease state. And the second is really around the strategic value of eyes and how they're the window to 265 other different disease states. Um, I wear the hat, again, of representing diabetes, and I find it fascinating that a third of people with diabetes are first diagnosed by their eye doctor. So what are we doing about that? And uh, again, I think we have a unique opportunity to transform not just eye health, but total health care. And, and then I'd say, listen, I heard a lot today about scaling up surgeons for technology adoption, which is clearly important for, for some of those adoption curves. But equally important is engaging consumers and getting them to honor their eyes, having them fall in love with their eyes. Sight matters. And I look at some of the industries around dermatology or aesthetics or even dental. My son, my 12-year-old, is getting for $6,500 Invisalign put in the, the price of a smile, $4,000 out of pocket for that. So I think about, again, honor your eyes, let's go get consumers engaged, and let's really leverage the asset base we have globally around the windows to many other diseases. So Tom, you, I want you to answer this question, but you have probably, I'm looking around, you, you've been in every stage of that, small, big, medium. So has consolidation hurt the industry? You know, first of all, I'd almost challenge, has it really consolidated? I think there's been change of ownership but you look across uh, this, this dais and it's all the same companies that are still here. So I, I, I guess I challenge whether it's really consolidated, but, but beyond that, no, I don't think, 
uh, certainly for AMO, uh, innovation hasn't been stifled. Uh, whether um, you know it was part of Allergan, whether it was standalone, or whether it was part of now Abbott, uh, we're proud of our pipeline. It's probably uh, the richest it's been in its history, uh, and we are looking forward to a steady cadence of innovation coming out. And I think um, over the all three of our businesses, Cataract, Refractive, and uh, consumer eye health, because I think that's a wonderful opportunity in terms of promoting overall ocular health. Um, so I think innovation, this meeting proves it every six months when we gather. Uh, it's alive and well, and it's certainly alive and well in our organization. And I think um, for my own bias, uh, I'm agnostic about where it comes from. Um, certainly, um, I, I've been part of the startup world, thanks to Bill, and, and we've had tremendous success. And I think big companies struggle sometimes uh, with, with uh, being able to be nimble enough to meet the needs of the marketplace. Uh, but I think there's a, there's a healthy balance that you have to uh, strike. And, and we do have a good uh, internal program, uh, but certainly uh, we're agnostic about um, uh, if there's good technology on the outside that can, as I said before, fit strategically and make a difference in terms of outcomes. Uh, we have to avail ourselves of that. Again, it's my topic, so I call it consolidation. Um, <laughs> you will get no more questions today. Uh, take the mic and the chair. Um, so, Ludwin and Bill, regardless of what you want to call it, <laughs> consolidation or not consolidation, the one thing that is different than probably the times Bill and Mike, I know we've been around, the amount of analysts that covered this space has dramatically dropped. Now, it did help that Chris and Tommy went public, but if you think about the amount of analysts that used to cover this space, there were a lot more. And analysts create uh, understanding of a category. So, William, tell me about how you think now with less coverage, how does that help us, or what do we do to overcome and create awareness? Well, listen, we have a responsibility first and foremost to shareholders and investors and our partners and our customers. Uh, analysts play an important role and create a great deal of awareness about a company, but we should understand where they fit in terms of our constituents. Uh, analysts want one thing. They want uh, news about new products, new technologies, new strategies. And I think that as categories um, move through various cycles, you'll to see uh, analyst coverage increase and decrease in, in direct relation to that. And I see that across a lot of therapeutic areas. Uh, when you see a lot of great work this morning or uh, just a while ago, there was a lot of discussion about what's happening in glaucoma in terms of implants and new procedures and how we're on a new frontier. That's going to create a great deal of interest by analysts because they know that's what investors want and that's ultimately their constituency. I don't worry too much about the analysts, more about the, the shareholders. I think the interest will come as long as we continue to invest in all the great work that's being done by a lot of people uh, in this room and around the country and the rest of the world. Ludwin? Yeah, analysts uh, create market transparency, so um, it's um, visible to everybody what's going on in the market and I, I would uh, actually believe that um, the transparency of the ophthalmology market has attracted um, a lot of investors and uh, certainly has also helped um, uh, startup companies to grow in that space. Um, so I, I would share your concern, um, uh, Jim, that you know a, a lack of transparency, less, um, uh, less analysis might result in um, you know, uh, uh, well, a, a less attractive market to, um, to investors. Um, however, um, you know, the, the source of analysts is not the only source, so it's pretty much common sense that ophthalmology is a very attractive market because it's driven by, by megatrends. Um, so I wouldn't be too concerned, actually, that this has a huge impact. Tom, you see how he kind of agreed with my question, so you might want to learn from that. That was good. He'll get, he'll get more questions. I think he agreed with my question. Uh, Bill and Cal. Bill, you've, at Versant, you've been known to work on this thing called Buy to Grow or build to grow, I should say, uh, business model. And Cal, actually, Valiant's been part of that, too. So I'd love to have you kind of comment, how does that improve the prospects for venture funding if we continue to do that model here in ophthalmology? Yeah, I've never um, heard of build to grow. 
it's build to buy. Build to buy. Yeah. So again, so never so, challenge. You know, you know, never you know, you challenge. You coach him. You coach him. He, he yeah. just. This so, is getting out of so control Jimmy, here, uh, really. I mean, no, build but, to uh, I need my glasses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. We can help. Yeah, <laughs> where's Presbyopia Solutions? Um, one of, the, one of the approaches we began to use and develop about 10, 12 years ago at Versant was a concept of teaming up early with a corporate partner. And you could call it a, a number of things, but if you build it for them, right, so you get alignment that this is strategically important, it's on strategy, and it's gonna fit if you can do it. And then if we can have a constructive relationship where um, the corporate partner invests substantially early, they can buy less expensively later because they don't, they don't uh, ha pay the same uh, multiple, if you will, in premium on their own capital that uh, uh, third-party capital requires. And so the event, I like the, the blended model, uh, and we still do standalone, fully um, funded uh, equity models. Uh, but we also seek to have these business relationships early. Two primary benefits. One <clears throat> is um, you can customize the path to make sure you stay on strategy by having input and guidance along the way. You can make it financially more efficient. And hopefully, uh, and, and you guys have heard this from me a few times, that this is, this is outsourced R&D. And shame on us if we're not more nimble and quick and efficient out here than can be done in any of the best corporations in, in, on the globe. And so that's kind of the concept, Jim, and it's build to buy. Sir. Well, Mar Marsha, Marsha, well, please help me. Cal. Um, first of all, I think build to grow is a wonderful term <laughs> and the inventor of it is a genius. Finally, somebody understands. Yeah, yeah. Finally, more questions for Cal. Yeah. So, so I mean, what, what does a big company like ours do well? We do regulatory sales and marketing. And so what do the small companies do well? They do that initial R&D and early D, uh, clinical, clinical work. And so, and so I think it's really the, the way to use us the, the best. And so, and so that whether it is, whether we are gonna get something from Versant, which we would buy to own or something from you that we would buy to grow. Um, in, either, in either event, um, I think that's the opportunity to, to, to use a company like ours, especially a fully integrated one. And, and so that we're, uh, right now today, we're the, the only one on, on the panel that has pharma and vision care and surgical all under one roof. And so what that really does is it makes us available to companies that no matter what their area is, so, thanks, good lead in. Tom and Mike, so in all seriousness, your device, where does drug device fit in? Who grabs that one when you, you found a drug device product? Does that, how does that play within a structure when you're really primarily device? I think we would have a look at the go-to-market strategy, and depending on what the go-to-market strategy was that may dictate which way it goes. The other is quite candidly, and the good thing about a company like ours is if, for example, the go-to-market was more pharma-oriented, but they didn't have the R&D wherewithal to do it, then it'd be fair game for us. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, the company is open for all good ideas and great business development opportunities. So, I, without, and I don't worry about those sorts of things. What I worry about is, again, looking for technology that's complementary, that gets us into new areas, and opportunities to take a few home run swings. Because I think companies that are leaders in a specific specialty need to take some home run swings to get a, you know, innovation way out there. So our relationship with Google, I mean, that's a perfect example. So again, I don't worry about it. I just, we just do what we think is the right thing for the specialty overall. Tommy? Yeah, and I would share those same thoughts, Mike. I think if, if it fits in the portfolio, um, you know, look, we're not a pharma company. And I would su suggest to you, that Abbott is in a pharma company. I mean, they're in established pharmaceuticals only outside the U.S. Uh, since the break off of AbbVV. I mean, we are a medical device company, but if presented with an opportunity, um, 
that had a drug basis to it. If, if we thought we had the right distribution channel to take advantage of the opportunity, it would fit right into AMO. Okay, Ashley and, um, let me see, William. You, so Ashley, I'm gonna go back to something you said. You have diabetes, correct? And, uh, and division. So uh, still at the end of the day, you have to make a portfolio decision. How do you make that portfolio decision? The dollar can only go so far. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we, Bill was mentioning that unmet need, you know, fortunately for both of those areas within J&J, &J, significant unmet need, over 450 million people with diabetes all around the world. And we always like to say in vision, 7 billion people, only half are in need of vision correction. I see a lot of, and only 10% are treating. So even us here. So, you know, a lot of unmet need. We then look at, again, we're in healthcare. Are these categories accretive to healthcare? Are they north of 5%? What do the trends look like over the next 10 to 20 years? And then the third thing we look at is what's the state of the science and technology and the pipeline? And where are we on the S-curve? So I use eye health as an example to say we've got a lot more upside on the S-curve of innovation. Uh, and then lastly, we look at you know, how can J&J &J offer differential value for customers and for patients? So those are really well-defined criteria that we use throughout all of those four groups that I mentioned for J&J. &J. And so, William, when you're sitting with Brent, how do you get his attention? <laughs> Make money uh, and serve our customers, of course. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, we're not spending our money, we're spending someone else's money. And there's a basic return on investment that we have to look at for each deal. Uh, in addition to that, it's not only numbers. There has to be strategic logic when we acquire a, a product or a product line or a company. Uh, we have to believe that we have the capabilities uh, to, to execute either a development or commercialization plan. If we don't, we have to be prepared to go and buy those. Uh, and there are a number of different factors. I think in any company, certain product lines and businesses have more strategic and economic value than others, and it becomes uh, completely obvious to the management team which ones those are. At Allergan, of course, uh, eye care is a really big deal. Our medical aesthetics business, really big deal. We also have a pretty good CNS and GI product line, and that's how we go about doing it. Okay, Ludwin, Bill Link, and Tom. Uh, I, f I read that McKenzie found that medical device industry has grown more competitive with local smaller companies reducing prices, innovative business models on a global basis on a global basis. So how do your large organizations uh, deal with that from a regional perspective? So Bill, as you're looking at it from, uh, you, know, uh, you, you know, you're on the board of Glaucos now, how, how do you handle that from a regional perspective as you look at it becoming a much more competitive basis and make the bigger decision? I'll go to you first, Bill. You know, I, it, it's all about um, delivering value and being compensated fairly for the value you deliver. And so if someone else can match you, okay, at a lower price, they're gonna win if it's the equivalent value. And so one thing we honestly do, um, because it, we're, we're never satisfied with the current form and current state of the technology, every company I've ever had the pleasure of being involved in has a pipeline and it's based on the learnings in the current state. What, what, what's not quite as good as, as it could be, oh yeah. And so shame on us if a small generic device player eats our lunch. That's our fault, it's not their fault. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I, again, I think you have to think globally but act locally. And um, uh, a great example, you know, you have to stay close to the customer, understand those local nuances and needs around the world. And one great example in the Abbott uh, portfolio is uh, our uh, uh, Compaq Intuitive, FACO. It's a mid-tier FACO really geared towards um, OUS markets. Uh, and if we weren't thinking locally and, and weren't staying connected to the customer needs, um, you know, we probably wouldn't develop a product like that. So I think, again, think globally but act locally. It keeps you nimble. Yeah, I think these local companies play an important role. Um, you know, um, th think of a, um, a Chinese company, for example, that has um, low-cost technologies, low-cost manufacturing capabilities. They would develop a product. Um, probably in the beginning, the performance would not be very high, but, you know, they could drive performance up to a point where it's acceptable to the market, and then they had a low-cost um, um, a product at reasonable performance. If an established company would try to do the same, 
it would start at the high end, high cost, high performance, and would uh, reduce the, the functionality, reduce performance, and it would probably end up with a high cost, low performance product, right? So which would not be competitive. Um, what I'm trying to say is uh, even the established companies have to go local to do the same, come from bottom up, right? And, and drive uh, at a low cost base, drive performance up. And that's, um, uh, I think, the way to go. Um, also, the large companies have to go local. So, Mike, uh, you, been, you were in the eye business for a long period of time. You left. You went to Hospira. You were very successful there. Came back. I'd like to ask two questions to you on the one. What did you, what could you relate from your eye experience to Hospira? Any similarities in the mindset? And then when you came back, what were you most surprised about? So I think what I uh, took from my care over to Hospira was the importance of being customer centric. So really that channel concentration. Uh, what I've always liked about, you know, Allergan in the aesthetic space, for example, is the concentration of products in that channel. It gives you a great deal of insights into the customers and also gives you first choice of all business development deals that come through. So as I look then at a channel concentration from going from Allergan to Hospira, it was exactly the same thing. And even coming here to Alcon, it's the same thing too. You know, you essentially get the same opportunity to get first choice of business development deals. And that's really the magic of that channel concentration. And also, I think, an unrivaled ability to partner with customers as you move forward, as you have a broad portfolio. So absolutely critical. What, what just, what's different than when you came back? I, I think I alluded to it earlier. I am really, really surprised at the refractive market, just how it is not developed. You know, at the ACOS meeting, I was saying, I think that there hasn't really been a champion for the marketplace. In the aesthetics market, there was a single champion, really, and it drove the marketplace forward, took care of negative PR. I think the refractive market has suffered from the negative PR. It's down at a place it should not be. It's a tremendous technology. I think we need to get together and push this technology I got forward. a great idea. Why don't the three of us make a commitment right now to drive the market? Again, I'll you're do taking you do over it? control. Yeah, baby, let's do it. Come on. You do it, huh? Again, right? Tom, Tom, moderator, panelist. Yeah, yeah, Tom. Moderator, panelist. I'm sorry, I thought I mean, he was really, the one. How do That's you work? How do you? I really feel for the AMO team that I used to have over there. <laughs> William, I'm going over here, please. Bring me, bring me over here. You're the, I think as I look, you're the newest to the industry. Give us your perspectives of our industry. Well, I've worked across uh, psychiatry, gastroenterology, infectious disease, uh, neurology, allergy, um, and Mike mentioned it. I've never seen a relationship exist between uh, companies, whether it be on the pharmaceutical or device side, investors, and the actual practitioners, the specialists themselves. It's, there's nothing like it in the industry. I think it's incredibly uh, refreshing. I think it's incredibly productive. In many, many other segments of pharmaceuticals mostly, there's a bright white line or even a brick wall between the companies that are doing the R&D and the physicians and other healthcare providers that are benefiting from the R&D. And it's for all sorts of reasons, but I think there's a middle ground and the eye care space has perfected uh, the model and I think it does great things for innovation. Ludwin, as you look at those bubbles, I think Zeiss has probably got the longest history of any of the companies, right? <laughs> you, yourself, Cal, or the company? Yeah, uh, probably also <laughs> true. 163 years for Bausch & Lomb. Thank you. Well, we have 170. You know, what, once again. Uh, again, oh, again, oh. again, oh. again. Emmett, can we go over roles and responsibilities <laughs> when we role play this? Again, person asking the question. Once again, the moderator is lost. And never control. challenging. Okay, you were the second oldest, uh, Ludwin. What have you seen has been the most consistent, though, over the years of your tenure when, in our industry? Uh, well, I obviously don't oversee the 170 years, right? So I can only speak about the last 10. Uh, and um, 
I mean, there's a lot of uh, consistency. It, it has changed, the structure has changed a little bit, as we said before, um, consolidation, um, but innovation is certainly constant, right? So it, th there has been innovation um, uh, over the years, although I believe actually that um, uh, innovation has increased over the time. Um, but it is, and the, the, the other thing which uh, I also feel actually has been a constant is that the, um, the very close collaboration between uh, industry on the one hand and the uh, ophthalmologists on the other hand drive um, the, the progress forward. And that's also kind of a, a constant which I see. Ashley, in J&J, &J, um, what do you see, what, what translate in J&J &J that makes ophthalmology different when you have your discussions with Alex? So, I, you know, I, a couple things. One, again, we've been in ophthalmology many years ago. We exited when we didn't think that we could create superior value then. So I think that, you know, J&J's grown up, the industry's grown up. Um, I think we can create differential value of understanding the device space, the pharmaceutical, the combination of those, as well as the power of consumer insights and engagement that we were referencing. I, I concur with Mike that I think refraction and the value um, of what people should be paying for their eyes is really low in terms of penetration. So, uh, you know, I, I would say Alex is quite bullish on eye health. We want to make sure that we can create differential value, that we can scale. Um, we've learned as an example in our biologic uh, program right now and for cell therapy, it's a very complicated supply chain. Um, and we've been very fortunate to be able to access the best in our device biologics to go be able to scale that program around the world with the right amount of stability for, for doctors. So um, stay tuned. Cal, you're the lone physician, um, ophthalmologist-wise. So what do you see? Because you have, you have a unique perspective in that you actually play the games that these That's guys right. and ladies bring to the market. That's right. And, and I have been with the company for 163 years, so I do have that perspective a, as well. But um, I think that when we look at, at a product, we first of all look and see where is the benefit to the patient. Because when I think about what I used to do, the 25 years that I was looking eye to eye to the patient, my concern was what were the tools that I had in my bag in order to take care of, of this patient. And so what are the things that we can do as a company to give the doctor in practice that much more tools? Give him better tools and actually sharpen the, the tools that he, he or she has. And so um, when I think about, about why a company like ours would have a surgical division, a contact lens division, a consumer division, and a pharmaceutical division, it's really because we're, we're talking to the same doctor. It's that same doctor who's going to use our IOLs or our FACO machines or our femtosecond laser who is also going to use our pharmaceuticals, who's going to use our contact lenses and recommend our eye drops and vitamins to their patients with, with, with AMD. And, and so that think about what the doctor wants. I remember when I was in practice, it always used to bother me that I would get multiple sales reps that come to see me from the same company. Why would, why would I get one sales rep who wanted to sell me glaucoma and another one who wanted to sell me dry eyes and another one who wanted to sell me antibiotics and they're from the same company? Doesn't the company realize that I want to be polite to these people, but if one person would come see me three times as often, instead of three people coming to see me, that would be better for me and for, and for my practice. And those are the type of ideas that we try to disseminate throughout Bausch and Lomb and try to think about not only what's best for us, but what's best for the doctor. So Tommy, you, you again, I was saying you, you, know, you were with a big company, then you went to a small company, you come back you're part of a large company now. What's been the learning that's been consistent in your career? Again, I think keeping your eye on the customer is, is paramount, whether you're in a small startup environment or in a larger uh, corporation. And that's you know, one thing I've, I've learned, uh, certainly in the field of ophthalmology. Um, if your customer, in our case, the ophthalmologist does well, uh, you will do well as well in that relationship, and I think uh, I've never lost, uh, never lost sight of that. Uh, and we also know the pace of innovation. 
happens very quickly in ophthalmology. So um, I think uh, for AMO, um, as I mentioned earlier, our pipeline is very robust, but we have to be nimble about a steady cadence of new products coming out of that pipeline that really do three things. One, improve outcomes. Two, drive efficiency. And three, promote overall ocular health. And, and that's our focus. And Bill, wrapping up the session, Tom talks about the customer. If we're having our 12th master of the universe, does the customer change? Well, no, I, th I think it's all about the patient. Um, and, you know, when we were building Intralays uh, some years ago, the team there, um, and we had to start and restart uh, a couple of times, but, but the mantra that was developed is if it's better for the patient and better for the customer, whether it's the physician or the practice or the institution, then we'll do fine. And so we have to check those boxes, and, and I think that's that's the that's what we aspire to do. And I know everyone up here uh, aspires to do that. I want to share a thought and a perspective relative to to industry skills and and um, and uh, organization. We have this range of requirements and opportunities that are device and optics uh, related. We have pharma for sure. And then we bridge those through uh, enhanced delivery. And it, m my perspective is that if a, if a leader has the, the skills and perspective and courage in each of those categories, they'll be at an advantage. So I'm a little disappointed, personally, that Alcon was separated out. It, that's a personal perspective. I'm sure it was done for the right reasons, okay, at a corporate level. But Alcon, for decades, was one of the few corporations that was you know, a leader in solid and pharma and a leader in solid and devices. And so they weren't intimidated by either of those areas. But I think J&J &J and, and others are, are involved in multiple sectors. And so they have, they have uh, skills and courage inside where they can go and find that, et cetera. So it just that's a personal perspective. Of, rummaged around at this for a long time, but one thing I watch is which corporations, uh, uh, you know, AMO would be a good example, it's a device company, okay? And so a drug delivery project is gonna be a stretch, doesn't mean it's not, a, it, it's not within reach, but it's not a natural. And so it's really interesting, it'd be, be fun uh, and intriguing to see how these things separate out over the next while. So I have seven panelists, I'd like to th thank six of them. Uh, very much for their contributions, and Tom, there's always in the morning. Uh, so thank you very much. Let's give them a big round of applause.